Hello and welcome to this Business NBN webinar on enterprise security. What is your weakest link? As we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the various lands from which we meet today and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Today, we're exploring the cybersecurity landscape we face in 2022 and what enterprise leaders can do to establish a security layer within their organisation and to effectively manage cyber threats. My name is Rosie Yeo. I'm a strategist and facilitator, and it's great to see so many CIOs and enterprise leaders joining us online today. It's clear that enterprise security is a hot topic for many. We have a panel of security experts ready to join the discussion. So let me introduce them now. Here in the studio, welcome to Darren Kane, who's the Chief Security Officer at NBN Co. And also Nigel Fair, the Director Enterprise at the University of New South Wales Institute for Cybersecurity. Welcome, gentlemen. Now, the wild weather conditions here in New South Wales have interrupted our plans to have all the panellists here live in the studio. So we have two of our panellists joining us virtually. Welcome to Rachel Fork, who's the CEO at the Cyber Security Cooperative Research Centre, and Phil Rodriguez, the Head of Security for APJ Commercial at Amazon Web Services. We know there have been so many cyber security breaches and attacks. I mean, over the past 18 months, there's just Every head, almost every second headline you read is about one of these. So, Darren Kane, what do you think, or how do you think enterprise leaders are feeling at the moment when it comes to the security landscape? Thanks, Rose. And may I say at the very start how sort of lucky and humbled I am to be able to be part of the panel here this morning. In answer to your, um, your question there, how do they feel? One would think they feel probably a little like I do, concerned. Um, there is a lot of information and news um, around the industry and in, in mainstream media, around the risk of um, particularly cyber, uh, which brings on a certain degree of a bordering paranoia. Is there enough controls in place? Is our maturity strong enough? Um, and in some cases, because of everything we see going on around the world today and, and here at the moment, uh, there might be even a, a, a little bit of decision freeze around this very issue. Um, so, so there is no doubt issues around is your maturity strong enough in most enterprises? Mm -hmm. And are there sufficient controls to keep that, that risk within the appetite that the, the company has actually identified? Um, the question really is, is the, is the board and the C-suite um, getting enough information from the accountable owners within the enterprise? Mm -hmm. And Nigel Fair, what are you hearing? Um, similar things to Darren, of course, but the, the next step is you get into the smaller, medium organisations which still have big balance sheets is that they're still not going through that mature risk management process to get the understanding of what their technology is, how it's being used, what data is being collected, who has access, what stacks it on, those sorts of things, to then make that mature risk analysis process to what controls they need to put around that. Mm -hmm. And Rachel, can I bring you in? What, what do you think is keeping business leaders up at night right now? Well, both to Darren and Nigel points, I, I do agree. I think the thing is is not knowing what they need to know and what they don't know. And at the moment, particularly, it's hard to know uh, whether a variant is going to, a new piece of malware is going to impact their organisation in ways that aren't foreseen. But what we do know is that those organisations that have very mature or very solid in-depth cybersecurity posture um, know that cybersecurity is a foreseeable threat and risk. And it's about having that trust in your team and others that you've you've built, you've got enough controls around your security so that no matter what is thrown at you, a bit like the variant for COVID, different malware variants come up all the time, how are you going to better manage that? But there's certainly an element of unknown unknowns and how you manage that. Um, to Nigel's point about small and medium business, absolutely, we know that they are the lifeblood of the economy, but that cybersecurity is often seen as a, an extra investment. So it is vital that um, small to medium businesses also um, uplift their security and no doubt um, they are also um, potentially worried about uh, cybersecurity and how presently how they could be impacted by this. Mm. Thanks, Rachel. And Phil, Rachel's mentioned there that, um, you know, obviously there's been heaps of disruption all over the shop over the last 18 months or two years. So what do you think, are there other things that are going to change when leaders approach, particularly as we come out of the post-pandemic, we hope, phase this year? How are leaders going to think differently about cybersecurity? Good morning, everybody. 
Absolutely. When we look back at the last few years, so many things have changed from a technology perspective, this whole working from anywhere, remote working, extended the threat landscape and, um, you know, caused some issues in the beginning. But here we are a few laters and we're used to this now. Um, when we look ahead to the next few years, a lot of the fundamentals around cybersecurity hygiene are going to remain consistent. Um, when we look at things like Log4j, which just happened in December, um, the best uh, response to that was good, consistent cyber hygiene. When we look at some of the current events around the world, again, the thing that we're focusing on is getting the basics right. Um, so when I'm talking to large organizations today, I'm getting them to look at visibility, simplicity, and consistency, and make sure they're at the heart of their cybersecurity programs. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Phil. And so it's obviously very hard to predict what's coming down the line in the future. But, you know, are there different types of threats that enterprises should be preparing for over the next three years? Nigel Fair. Thanks, Rosie. Um, yes, there's many, many threats. And, and one great thing about cyber criminals is, is they're very rational. They know how to, you know, change what they do to what works if they're onto a winner that's making them money. And on the whole, this is all about making money. Um, they'll stick with it, and we see that with ransomware, for example, but they'll also change tactics if they need to as well. So that's really what we've still got here and now. So uh, I think organisations you know, need a combination of the both. They need to think about what are we doing exactly right now to protect the enterprise, and then what they need to do into the future, what the strategy is, and working out you know, where their next technology investment is going to be and what the risk management thinking they have to do around that and what the control framework subsequently after that they have to implement. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Sadly, Rosie, I think everything that, that Phil and Nigel said is, is absolutely correct, but, but more importantly, <clears throat> what, we, what we're experiencing now sadly isn't going away. We're going to be actually forced to actually confront this issue well into the future because we've actually become such digital natives. And because we're relying on technology to invade almost every aspect of our life, um, we're going to actually have to understand that the need to be forever vigilant. And uh, the, the real next zero day will be when we realise exactly what that means. Rachel, can I bring you in just thinking about, I know it's impossible to sort of predict exactly what's going to happen and what those threats are going to be, but what do you think are the particular areas that are going to be most challenging when it comes to cyber security over the longer term? Sure, thanks for that question. I think the bigger challenge is always about making sure that our, that your people are well trained. We do know um, we do know what's coming and we know that uh, particularly with ransomware and other threats, phishing is still one of the most successful ways um, cyber criminals and nation states are able to get into organisations. What we do know is to Nigel's point, uh, cyber criminals um, are incredibly adaptive. They work out how to um, find gaps. We saw that after COVID where cyber criminals in hours were able to mimic official government correspondence and send around emails that look very similar with a malicious link in them, hoping then to get into people's either take their credentials or to get into systems. So what we do know is that we've got we've got cyber criminals who are incredibly, they've always worked from home. They adapt well in every environment. But we also can't overlook, um, in my experience, the, I won't necessarily call it insider threat, but the well-intentioned employee who just makes a mistake or send things home or doesn't change passwords or uses the same password for everything. So it's a bit of getting to, to Phil's point, getting the basics right and continuing because the basics done well will stand every organisation in good stead. And it's also just understanding that the variants will come at you, again, going back to the, to the COVID experience, that new cyber threats will always happen. It's about staying the course, but not overlooking that often in my experience, it's been mistakes and, and little things that have undone organisations, not necessarily been undone by the big sort of nation state. It's a small thing. So it's 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 the whole combination of people, places and sort of tech and how we, we secure all of them. So the weakest link can be quite a small link in the chain then. Absolutely. It only takes one person to click on a link in your organisation for the for, for the cyber criminal or the nation state to get a to get a foothold, to be in your network, to understand how your network works. And it just takes one person to even the most well trained person to click on a link. They're not thinking they're too busy and to to invite the and well again and not in a blame culture. Just one person clicking on a link is often how they get in. Mm -hmm. So Rosie, I'd just like to add that and. Very supportive of what Rachel's just said. 
that's why I like to actually coin the, the term the trusted insider instead of an insider threat. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because it's, it's more than likely a well-intentioned individual who has actually made a small mistake that is likely to cause you dramas. Not so much the, 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 the actual insider threat who is everybody who's trying to do their best. Mm -hmm. So we've probably got to get away from that language of uh, uh, almost uh, aggression. Mm -hmm. Interesting point. Yep. And I do in a moment want to come back to just what you can do to build that culture of um, security within your own organisation. But first, I'm also interested because I spend a lot of time working with large organisations and, you know, you look at any risk matrix and cyber security is up there. It's got the big capital letters. It's a lot of detail put into it. Um, but I'm interested, and maybe if I can go to you first, Darren, how are approaches to cyber security moving beyond those traditional risk frameworks? Look, look, thanks very much for that question. It, it's a great opportunity for me to hop back up on my soapbox. But for, for four or five years now, um, I've been trying to change the actual understanding and uh, acceptance of what people that manage security risk do in an organisation. You know, the image of the hacker in the hoodie, the image of the security team being in the basement. Security risk is currently one of the more senior business operational risks that any enterprise will face, no matter the size, no matter the department. What we've got to understand in the industry and help the, the leaders of our organisations understand is that we are now something that should be treated just like finance risk, health and safety risk, customer risk. It is so prominent. You do not need someone who is specifically trained in security to manage the accountability. You need a senior business executive that uses the language of the executive team so they can appreciate and understand. Now, the reason I say that is because security are not brakes in a motor car that you tap on and stop because that's the image it's always been. Don't go to security because they'll stop you doing things. Brakes in a motor car are there to give the driver the confidence to drive the car as fast as you can knowing you can stop if you have to. So what I'm saying here is that if we haven't changed yet, we will definitely change in the future to seeing security as an enabler of high performance rather than a group of people who are living in the basement constantly saying no. That's a, that's a striking image, that absolutely moving away from that risk concept to calling it out as an enabler. I wonder, Rachel, what's your perspective on this? Do you see business leaders, are they able to change their perspective? Because everybody does just focus on the risk, the risk, the risk. Definitely, and, and Darren, you need to step off the soapbox and I'll get back up on the soapbox now. I absolutely agree. I, for years, I've seen IT as, a, usually it's labelled IT as, as the IT guys in the black T-shirts and hoodies as the ones who give the cyber advice. It is absolutely a mainstream um, risk to every organisation, big and small. And, and it's, this, it's from the board down. It should be the CEO. He's also really the chief security officer. And, and what we do see is senior leaders in Australia, like Andy Penn, the CEO of Telstra, talking really publicly about cyber security and this is vital because it shapes and influences his peers it shapes and influences the culture no doubt of Telstra but the culture in government and everywhere when we have senior leaders calling this out as a risk that's absolutely vital so my view is um, it, yes it is a, a business risk that that every leader needs to be if you're if you're involved in or responsible for a company that has got systems connected to the internet you are a security officer for those purposes so I'm really passionate about seeing it um, across the board being accepted just as OHS and, and and risk is a risk accepted by the board directors and senior management that is no different cyber security is a risk we all carry throughout business um, thanks Rachel now Phil I'm happy to offer you the soapbox now because it seems to be a popular space to stand at the moment how do you see this like do you see cyber security moving beyond the traditional risk frameworks and also do you see leaders stepping up and actually taking responsibility on that front and being engaged with it. Yeah, this is exactly what we should be talking about because this is how we see organizations actually move the needle for cybersecurity and its culture, its culture and its culture. Um, nowadays in 2022, most organizations have access to the same great security technology. Um, you can get encryption if you want, you can have strong controls, you can have persistent monitoring, et cetera. Um, and I'd like to think that cloud has had a part to play in that. Um, but when we look at organizations, we see some organizations are quite secure and other organizations, not so much. 
So what's the difference between them? If it's not technology, it's culture. Um, I thought Rachel's example of Andy Penn was a great one. You've got a very visible Australian leader up talking visibly about security and that sets the tone for his organization. Um, at AWS, our CEO, he cares about patching. He understands patching. He talks a lot about patching. Guess what? As an organization, we follow his lead and we care a lot about patching too. Um, so if you're a chief executive, if you're leading an organization, get up there and help to transmit that culture and start by talking about security. Mm -hmm. And can I ask, Nigel, can I bring you in? Sometimes people in the C-suite and particularly around the board table, and I know you've sat around a lot of board tables, they don't have the language or they don't have the confidence to take on these issues. How are you seeing that? Are you seeing that change? Oh, ever so slowly. I'm going to get back to Darren's point. Words matter. And I actually don't like the word cyber at all. Okay. I, like, I like the more, you know, it's holistic. It's operational technologies. It's information technology. It's the whole suite of what is security. And I really think that's where we need to get those people, I'm not going to say educated because words do matter and I'm talking down to them, but get them thinking broader across the enterprise for all risk. And we're getting guidance for that too out of, out of government. If, you, if we wind back to the 2020 cybersecurity strategy where the government was, was raising um, director responsibility. If we look at ASIC taking um, a matter of the court through RI group for lack of cybersecurity mm -hmm. uh, court controls, posture if you will. So we're starting to see things come along you know, the new Cyber and Critical Infrastructure Centre, for example, there's a lot happening out there and I think it's all for the positive as a jurisdiction. And do you think boards know where to go, where to find this information? Like, like everything, some do and some don't and some are in the, in the middle, but there is, we're developing rapidly so many good things out there. I'd be disappointed if a company director said, I'm not sure what I've got to do because either they're not doing enough to um, get their own information or their senior management and informing them saying, these are some things you can do to, and we're going to help you along the way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I would just like to add that I, I truly believe, I think the industry has a huge role to play here. Um, the, the security risk industry, mostly cyber, we are traditionally defensive. We're always trying to explain something. We're always trying to almost explain the risk and protect, you know, particularly the catas catastrophe that could happen if we don't get the money or recognition we need. Um, I think we've got to get away from that and we've got to actually talk up, this is what we can do for the organisation if we do this. So stop catastrophizing the risk and talk up the promise. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we, we should be able to use language that gives them the understanding and the opportunity to see how good it could be rather than how bad it could be. And that's the problem. When we go to a board table or even to C-suite, we always, you know, they're all going across, what's the bad news now, right? We've got to change that attitude and that brand and reputation we carry. And it's not for the board nor the C-suite to do that. It's for the industry to change the attitude. And um, moving on your car analogy, does that mean also you've got to turn up to the board and have a really clear idea of what type of car you're going to be offering to them? If you're talking about the brakes on a car, it's got to be a good car, right, to motivate everybody to be interested. Absolutely. I've got to be wholly invested in what it is the company offers as the value proposition. I must know what the company wants to achieve in their strategy. It's my job to do that and then to actually work in where security will sit there to allow that to happen. Mm -hmm. What we're not doing is investing ourselves in the business. We're too busy trying to actually see the woods through the trees. Mm -hmm. So you're right, absolutely. Phil, are you seeing that too? That you know there is a role here for security professionals and the senior, the CIOs as well, to change change the terms of the conversation, if you like. Yeah, absolutely. I, I love that phrase, words are important and words matter. Um, these issues have clearly become more important to everybody. I love Nigel's example of the Aussie 2020 cyber strategy, really the federal government setting the tone that this is important and here's some of the fundamentals everybody should be doing. And we're definitely starting to see that trickle down. Um, Fortunately or unfortunately, events over the last few years and current events now, we're really raising the profile of this. I've had large organizations that were not traditionally deeply security conscious, maybe traditional manufacturers, logistics, et cetera, really come to us um, quite seriously recently and say, how can we be more, more secure? This is really important to us. And what we've coached them on 
What we focused on are their language, their visibility to their board, and their simplicity and visibility with their internal systems. So we are starting to see a change, um, and, and some organizations are really starting to move ahead. Mm -hmm. And actually, Phil, while I've got you, no organization is an island right now. So we've all got supply chains, third-party providers. How are larger enterprises managing the security risk that fans out across supply chains? Yeah, it's a complex issue and the industry really hasn't solved this entirely yet, um, but I will use some specific examples. Mm -hmm. um, what everybody's got to do is use trusted tools and platforms and suppliers, um, but not everybody knows who their trusted tools and platforms and suppliers are. Um, so just having knowledge around who you're working with is an essential first step. What we're seeing a lot of organizations do now, because we're on the inbound requests, we're third parties to many people, um, what we see organizations do is sort of send us a questionnaire. Hey, AWS, are you secure? Can you fill out these boxes? Um, and actually, we don't respond in that way. We don't just go through their checklist and say, yes, yes, yes. What we do do is we take our trusted global audit program and the third-party audit reports that we have, like our SOC 2 report, et cetera, that's been done by an external third party that covers all of our physical facilities around the world and goes through thousands of different controls and has very specifics about what was audited at what time. Um, so when an organization like some of the organizations today that work with us ask us these questions, we actually hand them the full detail of our audit reports. And that's my challenge to the industry. Um, we've been doing that for our millions of active customers around the world for 10 years. Um, why don't you? Um, do you give your full audit reports to your suppliers and your third parties and your customers so that you can help extend that trust through the supply chain? Great challenge there, Phil. And I might go, Darren, AWS has its own system and its own end-to-end -end system. What do you see other enterprises doing? Like, are they starting to bridge the gap or is there still a big gap here? SOS, security of supply. Um, it, it's become an issue, particularly through the pandemic we realised it was all about provision of supply at the time, but now with Log4j and SolarWinds the year before, um, you know, it's all about, well, what security do your suppliers have in place? So most large enterprises, and, and to be sure, these smaller businesses and enterprises that Nigel was speaking of previously, they need to actually understand what their provider has actually got in place to ensure that what they're selling you is safe and secure. Um, it's my job to have a relationship with those suppliers, not just third party, but fourth and fifth and the subcontractors of the fifth party. Mm -hmm. So you've actually got to map that back. Um, you've also got to actually have, and Phil at AWS is a, is a trusted vendor of ours. Mm -hmm. I've got to have a relationship with Phil so that um, I can actually pick the phone up and ask him a question and believe in what it is he tells me. Um, I, I, if you've got to take anything away from this part of the conversation, it is the relationship you've got with your supplier has to be trusted. Mm -hmm. If it's not trusted, change suppliers. Mm -hmm. Nigel, I might go to you. Do you have anything to add on that one? Yeah, I, I, I'm a believer of the maturity scale and organisations, again, I'm going to stick more at that middle level. And, and the great thing about technology and providers like Phil, etc., is that you can significantly amplify your business through third party. So we've got to remember, going back to that, there's a positive in all of this use of technology. We're not just going to be here to, to say, talk it down. But we want to get away from if there is a questionnaire, for example, if, if that's your chosen way of doing it, I'm not going to sort of say whether you should or you shouldn't. I like what Phil pr provides as he's, in his answer there. But really think about, is that a mature enough response that you want? And don't go, it's not a binary, yes, we have cyber or no, we don't. So a mature response is what Phil talked about. A less mature response might just be answering a questionnaire. I think it's up to the organisation to work out, going to Darren's point about the trust, getting that response with a, with, from that, do I trust that vendor, yes or no? Do I want a more mature response? If they can't provide it, then maybe they're not the vendor for you. Mm -hmm. Good point. Um, now, I might actually move the conversation now because we talked a little bit about culture earlier and how it's so important to have that culture of security throughout the whole organisation. And I'd love to discuss actions that enterprise leaders can take to improve the culture around cyber security in their organisations. Um, maybe, Phil, can I go to you? We talked a little bit previously about how that responsibility potentially should shift 
so that CEOs and CIOs and the whole C-suite actually takes a more active involvement. How do you change that culture? Yeah, I'll start maybe with just a brief negative example. What you should not do is send all of your security metrics and all of your telemetry and all of your IDS alerts and everything up all the way to your board. Nobody understands what that means and, and it, it's, it's complex and it's confusing. Um, what organizations should do is pick a small number of KPIs for security. Um, what you wanna do is talk to your security team, talk to your technology team, talk to your leadership that manages those, those teams and, and agree what are our most fundamental security principles and then measure those things super carefully and report on them consistently from the systems at the bottom all the way to the executives on top. Um, there's no universal advice for which categories. If I was gonna suggest something, it'd be patching status, authentication or password status and encryption. Um, and push yourself and push your organization to be as close to 100% on those as possible. Um, so say we're going to encrypt 100% of our data, make sure your systems are reporting on that status and give visibility just to that single KPI to your organization. And, and your execs are going to understand a lot more about your fundamentals, which are important. And as they see that rate of change over time, they're going to decide, you know, do we need to invest more or not to move this needle? So that's just one place to start. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting too, isn't it? Getting that right list of topics that need to be reported back or the right list of issues that need to be reported back up the levels. Rachel, can I go to you? How, how else can we improve the collaboration that's needed throughout the organisation? Sure. So on the right list of metrics we're reporting up to the board, what, what traditionally we have done with boards is um, give them dashboards and that is can be helpful, but it also can not be helpful because they don't, there's no nuance in a dashboard. They, uh, board members just tend, tend to get trained to the three colours and a lot of green good, a lot of red bad. And I don't think that's helpful. I agree. I think it's really helpful for board members to understand what are the systems and the data that's most vital for our organisation and how are we securing it and to Nigel's point, accessibility of language is everything because boards need to, every board member doesn't need to un, need to code, but they do need to understand how to effectively manage that risk. So they're serving it up in a way that they not only know what questions to ask, but they also know the questions to the answers and whether there's um, the answers are accurate or not. So it's one thing to ask good questions, but it's also another thing to understand the, the answers you're getting and whether you can pull that thread further. I think the enterprise culture can can be improved because if if everyone knows that that's what that they're the measurements that boards are looking at they will ultimately have to improve right through the company to the case that um, Nigel mentioned earlier RI advice group which is currently before the courts it is an issue of whether even management um, briefed the board and they understood the risk at the time so there's a, sometimes can be discordance around not wanting to let the board know bad news or we can't have a culture of oh no no we don't take problems to the board there has to be that culture that we do also share problems with the board as long as there's a solution you're not just throwing a problem on the table but that the board does get to understand the complexity or otherwise of that organisation and what they need to be looking at or what can be focused on for improvement. There are a whole bunch of metrics and different metrics, but it is really about, you know, um, depending on the risk factors for your business, what is vital for you doing business and how you're securing that. But the board, really the nuance in my experience is having sat on boards and dealing with boards is the nuance can often be lost in how you report it. So it's really vital that it's not just dashboards, it's somebody like Darren or an executive who can lend colour to it, who can explain it. And the important thing too is um, submitting yourself to a third party audit every year, just like we do with financial audits that's saying, yep, but you don't have to believe me. We've got, you know, X company in and not just a tick and flick exercise. We've actually got a third party, a trusted third party in to do a review of these to make sure we've got this right. And then I think from then you, you have a framing for the board and then down about what the real risks are and how they are effectively being managed. What you don't want is somebody to go into the board and say, we're all over this. It's fine. Nothing to see here. Because in my view, then you might be wanting to get other people to give you a view of that enterprise security. I might just add, and again, agree with both uh, Rachel and Phil. Um, I'll give you an experience I had just recently, a couple of weeks ago, and this is around the small to medium enterprises who are turning over, you know, large seven-figure sums. I have a, a great mate who's a managing director and um, an owner of a, a large motor dealership in, in South Australia. And over a meal, we were talking, he was curious. 
he was self-aware of the issue, but he wanted to know more. And the big debate was that he spends a lot of money on managing security in his business, but he felt that it was the problem of the vendor providing the service. Mm -hmm. And the discussion became, no mate, it's your problem. You've got to be more conscious of what you need to know to ensure what you're getting as a value proposition is what you're paying for. And he said, but, but why am I paying all this money if I'm gonna do it? I said, because your responsibility and ownership of the issue now is that this is a significant business risk to your organisation. You can't just farm it out. It's not something you can subcontract away. So I think to any of these businesses out there that don't have large boards or large cyber security capability like the organisation I work for, if you're actually actually you know conscious of the risk and you want to do something about it, you've got to buy into it. Now I might take moving on from that point too, or taking up that point, um, when it comes to regardless of the size of the organisation, when you're thinking about people within an organisation and enterprise security, you often hear that phrase, you know, that people are the weakest link in the chain. What's your take on that? <clears throat> Look, people are sixty percent of my concerns. They're 80% of my problems, but they're 100% of my solutions. Um, so fr from my perspective, um, people are, you know, the, the concept of if folks can make it, folks can break it. So technology, machine-based learning, new capabilities, they will all be incredibly valuable, okay, to helping keep the risk within the appetite. But ultimately, it will be the people that ensure that that's done. Um, so it's the last word here is, is that in most organisations, people are not the weakest link. In most organisations, people are the missing link. We're not spending enough time educating and buying them into the problem to make them understand that security is everyone's responsibility. We've had a number of examples through Rachel, Phil and Nigel this morning about the importance of culture. Um, the issue around folks in your organisation and such an important role they play. So definitely not the weakest link, certainly the missing link, and we need to do more in that space. Mm -hmm. Phil, do you take that view too, that they're the missing link, and if so, what do you do with that? Yeah, absolutely, especially when it comes, um, you know, I think Darren's point is to the, the broader population, right, like everybody within an organisation. We're also noticing a critical skill shortage within the cyber specialists themselves. Um, there's been a number of projections around the hundreds or thousands or millions more people that we need just here in Australia in order to meet the cyber security demands of the entire digital economy by 2025. Um, and we've done some research where we talked to large organizations around Asia Pacific, um, and, and they say things like um, they don't have people inside of their teams to understand what cybersecurity skills and training is out there on the market. Um, their people don't have the time to take the classes to increase their level of cyber uh, education over time. Um, and when we're looking at skills that are in demand, um, when we talk to that same cohort of business leaders across Asia Pacific, they called out cyber secu security as the number two uh, area where they needed the most skills by 2025. Um, so, so pretty much whatever research or news report you look at, we're all seeing a cybersecurity skills gap. And, and, and the question here is not to recognize the gap, but it's how you, and I'll leave this as an open question, how you as a leader in your organization are doing to actually start to fill that cybersecurity gap, to train your people, to invest in external training programs. Mm. Nigel, what's your take on that? I mean, there clearly is a skills gap. How, do, how can we tell everybody to you know, focus on your people and educate your people and when there's a skills gap there? So, so I think a couple of things, and speaking of soapboxes, I've got about 100 of them just behind this chair here. Darren's stolen one of them, but that's okay. Going back to the, to the words matter thing, Darren raised a really good point earlier about the insider. And I think we've really got to be careful how we nuance our terminology. So I'm, I'm with Darren, I do not like the word insider threat. We know from nearly four years of statistics of notifiable data breaches that one third, this is consistent with every six months reporting, one third of, every, of all the data breaches are from an internal person. We kind of don't know whether it's a malicious or a silly person, but we sort of need to start being really careful with how we portray that person and how we can help them and how they can help up to us to Darren's point. So I think words are really careful. Victim shaming and blaming, 
is, mm -hmm. is obviously a no-no. Even really careful with how we say, with, with nuancing our words around if it seems too good to be true, it probably is when it comes to scams. Every bit of academic and other research says that at the time that person didn't think it was too good to be true. They were hooked in through that, that romance and dating scam or that great investment opportunity that's only available right now, not in 10 minutes time. And they actually believed it, that's why they, they did it. So we've got a lot of work to do to bring out people on that journey. And uh, it's, a, it's a work in progress, logically. Mm -hmm. And look, look I'd, love, I'd love to go, maybe Rachel, I might go to you in a moment because I'd like each of you to think about, you know, if there's enterprise leaders out there listening to the conversation this morning, feeling not that confident in their own cybersecurity culture in their own organisations, what are some steps that they can take right now to either start to build or regain that confidence in how to build this operating environment that supports cyber security and doesn't, as you say, victim blame or, you know, take a, take a more negative approach to it. Rachel, can I start with you? Sure. Obviously, there are um, the, there are sources of information like the Australian Cyber Security Centre um, in order to sort of, for particularly small to medium business guidance out there about how you can build steps. There's frameworks as well, and there is obviously external consultants. I think the important thing is um, is it is people, places, and information. It's not just having great tech. It is a combined response of having really good tech, and to the point about training your people, uh, not shaming your people, uh, and and really encompassing a good approach to it all. There's no I think the thing I'd like to say is that there's just no one single tech solution. There's no one great thing. This is a journey. It's an iterative journey. So investment and understanding what this means, unfortunately, it's sort of not over. You haven't solved it in four weeks. It's something that takes time and investment. But I think the good thing is recognising if you do have a risk problem, what you can do about it and being on a journey to good is really vital. But there is sort of resources out there already and organisations that can help you get a better sense of the unique risk to your organisation and how you can effectively manage it. Mm -hmm. Thanks. And Phil, what else, what steps can leaders take? Um, for me, it's all about visibility. Um, if you're a leader right now, sit back and ask yourself, do you have the detailed visibility that you need around your actual status with cybersecurity, around all the dark corners of your organization, no matter how big or small it is? Um, and to pick up on a point that was raised before, do you have a security leader next to that data to help you interpret it and understand what next steps you should take. Um, you know, the world had a big cybersecurity vulnerability back in December, like poor Jay, and straight away, we saw people asking questions like, are we patched or not? Do we have an impact from this? Um, organizations with that visibility and that security leadership were able to respond faster. Organizations that didn't understand their patch status or didn't understand where their systems were took a lot longer. Um, so the one thing that leaders should be focusing on now is visibility. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Darren, what about you? <clears throat> Both good examples from, from Phil and Rachel. Uh, I'm going to be a little bit um, different. Um, I actually think it's the messaging and education and awareness of your organisation uh, can have an enormous impact on culture, just the basics. Um, you know, set, set a target as a baseline. Is it the essential aid and the ACS or ASD? Is it um, something that you've got from NIST or, or one of the different certifications globally? But set that baseline and then work towards the baseline by ensuring the whole enterprise, everybody in it, no matter the size, gets to that point. Now, how do you get that message out? You don't get Darren Kane to do it, you know, because unfortunately, I look a bit like a pub bouncer and I scare people into it, right? What you do is you go out and you find a, a, a great marketing team, mm -hmm. a great comms team, and you bring them in as people who are part of your security team. They are embedded with you so they truly understand the message, but most importantly, they understand how to sell the message. We're not doing that well enough. We're not using the right communication skills mm -hmm. and we're not making, you know, looking at different ways to do it. I love that show on, I think it's SBS or one of them called Wellington Paranormal. Crazy stuff, but um, I've got this idea of why can't we actually take that type of medium to sell the message of security risk so people actually want to see each, each episode, but not only that, take in the message in the episode. That's the way we've got to start thinking around the change of culture. Mm -hmm. So uh, Nigel, it sounds like what we need to create is a fantastic sitcom. It's all about cyber security, is that right? I'm, I'm surprised Darren's got time to watch TV. Yeah. <laughs> I'm what, sorry. But the, 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 what I will is um, 
I'm wary, I, I think it's a good idea, I'm wary when I see um, products from vendors out there talking about gamification, mm -hmm. because that's not proven to work in, in every situation. It's thrown out there as a, we have this great product using gamification. Traditional, going back to using marketing efforts, traditional marketing works for a reason and it'll work internally and I fully agree with that. I think the next extension to that is measuring what you do. Yep. And if you measure what you do and it's working, you can keep doing it. If not, you can pivot to other things. And there's, there's great products out there that, that measure advertising. Why not use those sorts of things that can say that a person of this, you know, whatever in this background, in this scenario, smiling, that works for buying products. Is that, is that working in our internal situation? Mm -hmm. And I would add, what, what we're trying to do with the marketing and the messaging is to actually break down the mystique, particularly around cyber, to get people interested to, to say, hey, I, I understand this. You're almost pricking their interest. And then you actually show development pathways for them to grow into the space, perhaps to, perhaps to, to Phil's point about redeployment into a security risk vacancy, mm -hmm. uh, perhaps to Nigel's point about further education. What we've got to do is break down this mystique around, oh, this is, this is all too hard for us, they're using language I don't understand. We've got to stop doing that and we've got to actually invite them in to help them understand. Mm, such an interesting challenge. Um, I might actually just shift for a moment too because we've talked a lot about culture and the way we communicate about security and the way we talk about it. But at the end of the day, there's also uh, you know, a lot of investment that needs to be made in cyber security, whether you're talking about your tools or your skills build up or whatever it might be. And I'm interested, you know, how should enterprise leaders approach making decisions on these, what can be really sizable investments? Rachel, can I go to you first? Sure. I think um, I think what's important is you invest in the areas where you know that you have the greatest risk and commensurate to whatever you make and your appetite. I think that's really important. I think what you don't do is um, is just throw. There's an example of a major bank in the US being uh, had been the subject of a hack or a breach several years ago, and then they just doubled their security budget. As much as Darren would probably like that. Um, it's not a matter of how much money do I need, because what I often hear is I just, you know, how much money do you need to spend? You need to spend enough to get the right controls in place that are effective for your organisation, be it technical controls, be it um, investing in longer term kit, but also for awareness raising as well. And that's what you need to do. And that will be different across every organisation, depending on their risk appetite. Mm -hmm. But Darren, you know, there are big budgets involved here, right? So how do you how do you then start thinking about that? Is it is the big packages the ones that work, or the big I don't know AI investment? Rosie, um, Rachel said it. You can't buy your way out of this. Mm -hmm. This is a problem that has developed over generations, so that you've now got three and four year olds using iPhones. So the security risk going forward will will, will continue to grow. This is all about the words I said around forever vigilance. It's all around what Phil said around culture, culture, culture. Mm -hmm. Sure, there is going to be a need to accept there will be a budget required in both capex and opex spend, maybe even a fixed allocation. If you're going to put money aside to rent uh, a footprint in a building, maybe you put money aside and say, right, we're going to have to manage that, at least to that level. Maybe that's an answer, but th the real issue here is it's not about spending your way out of the problem. Mm -hmm. it, it's about accepting you have a problem and then going back to the enablement analogy, okay, where is the risk appetite of the organisation? Have we got controls in place to stay within that appetite? Which then gives you the opportunity to feast on the rewards. Mm -hmm. So if you put one dollar into managing security risk, because of that can you make four? And that's where you need really good metrics. And you need that conversation and you need that change in the viewpoint that security is actually the enabler. That's right. And somebody in my role has to stop being the security guy and has to start being a senior business executive walking, working with the C-suite and board in that manner. Mm -hmm. You've got to be able to prove to even a small to medium enterprise, a kitchen cabinet maker, you actually cover off uh, your, um, your, your customer relationship management system so that the, the, the personnel's data is secure and you're happy with that and you're content with that, you can then spend more money in building out that database. Mm -hmm. That's the sales pitch. Mm -hmm. Nigel, when you look at the C-suite and boards having these conversations and making these big decisions, how can they make them better? I think it's, 
on looking at maturity. Mm -hmm. I think it's looking at risk, as Darren said, as, as an enabler. Businesses thrive by taking on risk. If they didn't, they, they wouldn't be in business. You know, they sit around and they think, the directors think about strategy and they think about governance, but they think about risk for the whole enterprise. This is just another wedge of the pie. There's almost nothing special about what we call cyber. And I think once they just use their normal thinking for, uh, on the rest of the pie for that little wedge, mm -hmm. that's when they'll go on. Because they make decisions, competent decisions, all day, everyday successful organisations about how to grow their business. So they just need to demystify it themselves a little bit and really think about, okay, this is, to Darren's point, it's an, it's an enable of our business. We, we want to be known as great for this. And if we're a third party, going back to what Phil said earlier, what is it that we're going to provide our, our upstream or even downstream customers for fourth and fifth supplies? How, how, how can we learn from you know, a big hairy organisation like AWS about their maturity and how they project it? And we go, we can do the same. I, there's a lot of good lessons out there. Mm -hmm. And Phil, actually, I might bring you in speaking about big hairy organisations and AWS. <laughs> what are you hearing as you hear this conversation about how boards and C-suites should be making decisions about these investments? Yeah, the, the only thing I'm not hearing that I want to add to the conversation is um, for some organizations, actually security is a very positive, proactive investment that's really going to fundamentally help their business. Um, I talked before about Telstra, we know NBN, these organizations care about security. They want to keep their infrastructure safe. They want to keep their customers' data safe. Look at Apple. Um, Apple listened to their customers and over the course of the last, I don't know, five years have implemented a number of very fundamental security and privacy features into their phones, um, into their hardware, into their software that's really changed the game for how information is shared at scale like that. Um, I don't think my iPhone's gotten any cheaper, but it hasn't gotten more expensive because I'm buying special security features that's been built into their core offering. So there's a number of businesses out there and, and maybe who we're talking to, maybe this is your business that can positively benefit by having a bigger investment in security and being more visible about it. Okay, so I, I know we're, uh, we're coming up close to time here and we've covered quite a lot of ground when it comes to changing the way we have the conversation, when it comes to the importance of building the culture of an organisation, not just limiting it to silos, changing the, the way we talk about it and the way you approach threats within the organisation and managing that as well. So I'd really love to ask each of you to come up with what's a key takeaway, what's one suggested action that the business leaders and CIOs who are sitting in on the call today and listening to your conversation, what's one action they could go away and take today to ensure that they're managing the best possible cybersecurity environment for their organisation? Nigel, can I start with you? Absolutely, Rosie. I think following on from everything we've spoken today is the journey. Take your people on the journey. Get them invested. Get them part of the program. Mm -hmm. Take them along with you. Mm -hmm. Great advice. Darren? Um, every entity, no matter the size, it could be the multinational or the, the small Uber driver, there is more upside than downside investing in an understanding security risk. There is more benefit to your organisation if you do that. That's a very simple message. Mm -hmm. What should people do with that? Understand what are their critical assets, what understand what is most important to protect in their entity. Is it people? Is it data? Is it infrastructure? And then ensure that those areas, those assets are your priority, that you protect them first, and then you protect them to within an inner level of risk appetite. So you don't have to actually wrap them up in cotton wool and never use them because you won't get value from them. Mm -hmm. But you have to put some simple things in place. And then once you've done that, you can take your focus away from that spend. You'll always need to be vigilant that you've got enough there, so you know back, you need to go back and revisit. But you've got comfort it's got, you've got something in place, and then you can concentrate on other things that are as important in your business. At the moment, you've got this um, you know, sort of Damocles over everyone's head around the risk of cyber. And it's, um, it, it's tough on boards, it's tough on business owners, it's tough on the folks that have got to run the risk. What we've got to do is actually get to a point where everyone's comfortable, they're managing their risk, and we all move forward. Mm -hmm. Great place to get to, right? Yeah, and, and, and as I said, once you start moving forward, you can then start to concentrate on the opportunities that'll come because you're in that state. Mm 
Mm -hmm. At the moment, if you're constantly running and catching up and running and catching up, you've never got time to strategize and take the benefit from that. Mm -hmm. And Rachel, can I go to you? What's one action that leaders could take today to build that cybersecurity culture within their organization? So it's all about people, people, people. It's understanding at the board level. So a commitment today could be that we're going to make sure our board um, have all the available information in accessible English and they're not bamboozled by um, lots of names and, um, and all sorts of things so that they have a better understanding. We're going to make sure that our people um, uh, understand that they are a key asset when it comes to the first line of defence for the organisation and that also our security people um, act and are important in also being a second and third line of defence. It all really boils back to, to the board, your staff, your security people, but at the end of the day, it's people. People make the tech, to Darren's point, to borrow that. People make it, they can break it, but people are at the heart of, of everything around cyber security. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Rachel. Yes, people are the missing link seems to be a common theme coming out for today. Phil, can I go to you? What's one action leaders could take today to build stronger cybersecurity culture in their organization? Sure. Hi, enterprise security leader. Uh, I want to ask you one thing. If you lead your organization, talk about security. Does somebody else lead your organization? Are you working for another leader? Get them to talk about security. Their voice is going to uh, disseminate that culture and that culture is going to trickle down. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Um, now, time for some audience questions from those watching online. Um, and here we go. This one's actually a great one because, again, I'm going to be asking you for one thing to make as a recommendation to our audience. Um, the question is, what is one thing that everyone should have top of their mind when it comes to their enterprise security more broadly? So we've talked about an action previously. This is probably a great question to think about for leaders particularly. What is one thing in your own mindset when it comes to security that you should have keep top of mind? And uh, Rachel, can I go to you first? I thought you were going to ask Darren or something like that and I could have ridden on his coattails. <laughs> um, uh, basically for me, as if, if I'm a leader in an organisation and I'm not necessarily technical, am I up to date? Do I read about the latest threats? Am I reading, and I, and I don't mean technical magazines or anything like that, am I subscribing to feeds or just understanding what's out there and what's relevant for my organisation? So again, I know what questions to ask. And I know what's out there, but importantly, I'm not sucked in by the hype. So really understanding just the threat level and what it involve, is involved for my organisation. Thanks, Rachel. Maybe Nigel, can I go to you? Absolutely. Think of everything on a maturity scale. So not binary, we have cyber security or we don't. It's how can we step through? If we look at the advice from government, for example, with the Essential 8, there's three steps in the maturity. So there's, there's a lot of guidance out there around that type of thing. I think work your way do the little things and I think Phil mentioned this earlier and then you know keep it simple but work your way through it rather than thinking I need a big budget to do a big bang let's do some little things mm -hmm. first what could be the first little thing that someone would do what would be that first little question they could ask I'd, I'd focus on identity and access management mm -hmm. know who your people are that are logging on know what privileges that they have, how are you managing those privileges, who has access to what, why do they have access to that information, that system, that device, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Start thinking about that, you mm -hmm. know, and if you give permissions to someone else, why do they get those permissions? Is it because this person went on leave, when they come back from leave, you've got to take those permissions away? You know, then we get into the past phrases, multi-factor authentication, Mm -hmm. those, those type of things. And then it moves on from there. Yep, lots of guidance out there, lots of vendors that will um, provide you with products. Mm -hmm. And uh, Phil, maybe I'll go to you now. Um, what's, what's one thing that leaders really need to keep top of mind when it comes to building that security culture within the organisation? Yeah, I love what Nigel said right there. Um, what I'm going to say is pick your security fundamental and understand it and drive it consistently over time. Um, on the point of security maturity, uh, when I sit down with leaders and ask them, what are your security priorities, and they don't have an answer to that, or they haven't thought through that question, they're typically not a mature organization. When I sit down with organizations that are secure, and I ask them what their security priorities, they can tell me right off the bat. So if you're watching, what's your key security priority? What's your data and telemetry you need to measure its progress over time? And how are you driving that program of change? 
Thanks, Phil. Darren, can I go to you? <laughs> You've left me a couple of little breadcrumbs on the table, everybody. <laughs> um, I, I loved uh, Rachel's um, issue around be curious. You know, if you're, a, if you're a very senior manager that's got the accountability for managing an organisation, you've got to be curious. You've got to ask the question. I love Nigel, your privilege access management, admin rights. You know, why have they got the access? Should they have the access? Um, Phil's comments, fantastic as well. Um, there's, there's not much more I can add other than, and I'll borrow that soapbox back, and everyone would be disappointed if I hadn't put this one up on the table. Um, I just think that today's security risk is so integrated. There's so much going on and built on technology platforms. And we rely so heavily on, on data-driven analysis and other things to manage all security risk um, from the onboarding process all the way through the life cycle of an employee and the life cycle of an asset all the way to the offboarding that you definitely can't separate what is a cyber event versus what is a physical or personnel event or even what is a privacy issue now with privacy breach. I think that the time has come for people to have a genuine discussion about do you need a single accountability for managing security risk and response in your business? Um, I've been on this bandwagon now for over a decade and I've seen it develop out to a point where you cannot almost separate where does one start and where does one stop. The days of physical security being in facilities, personnel security being with HR, privacy being perhaps with legal and reg, and of course uh, cyber being under the CIO, and then trying to actually compete for budget and trying to actually justify your input into an incident, particularly at the review as to how it happened, it's everyone else's fault. I think they've gone. I think the government's expecting one accountability and I think most majors have got to that point. It's now a situation where if you're running a small to medium business, you appoint someone who's accountable for security risk, which includes everything to do with security in your organisation. I think there's, there's a key takeaway as well as a thinking point. Fascinating there. Look, I think we've covered so much ground today with our panellists, um, both on the big picture, how do you actually conceptualise what a culture of security looks like in your organisation? And there have also been some really um, helpful, tangible takeaways for action. So a special thank you to everyone for joining this webinar. Um, brought to you, of course, by Business NBN. To learn more on this topic and many of the topics we've been covering this morning, you can visit the NBN Knowledge Hub online. Most importantly, a special thank you to our panel of experts today. Darren Kane, Chief Security Officer at NBN Co. Nigel Fair, Director Enterprise at the UNSW Institute for Cybersecurity. Rachel Fork, CEO at the Cybersecurity Cooperative Research Centre and Phil Rodriguez, Head of Security for APJ Commercial at Amazon Web Services. Thank you all everyone and have a great day.